John.
You don't happen to have a pocket knife on you by chance, do you? Yeah. Can we cut the twisty ties? Sir, please. I'm gonna take this off. That way I can let the camera rest for a while. There's four of them, so you might have to cut like at least four of them. The other tied, unless you have a trick. Is it alright that I stand out here? Mm -hmm. We're just about to cross Lovato. Yeah, just hold on tight. Thanks, John. Track down below that we're going to be going on. We're going to do it too. Up ahead. Because Osher is down down there.
going back. Yeah. Uh, Corey four pulling this day. K36. Like we had four years ago, two us.
Macy 19 follow us back to Ed Ozer. Because he's going back to Asnito. Like we are. This is the Los Pinos River, or lake as we call it now. Usually this whole pasture is flooded. flooded. It's underneath the water half the time. But now since we're in the fall, and we even hit down a bunch of rain up here, that's what it's going to be at. And we can get snow this season that we were hoping for. And this whole area will be under water. Because we've had actually water come almost to the track. Let me say this, it's not fun when you have to go through wet track. These are old arrow ties that used to be right there. They're heavy. They're too heavy. You can't. Well, they are. They're over 100 pounds. You know, you want to know how many it takes? You want to know how many it takes to pick up one of those? Four. That's right there. dark for a while. We don't have any lighting in here. So this is all the light you get from up there and then we're in here and the next one is mud tunnel. Huh? This one and the next one up ahead. Yep. There you go. Full season view of Toltec Gorge. Because the mountain right here was blasted with dynamite. Yeah. This is all that made. U.S. Army did this for us, the military, when we were building this line. For their practice runs, would come out here and make holes for us. Now, mud tunnel is a whole different story. Okay, yep. The one that's made all out of mud, with um, railroad ties holding it up. Good. Yep. Because it's a support beam along the whole tunnel. You'll see it when we go through. Because the entrance even has the railroad ties on it. I think we're coming. Up. We should be coming up to it pretty soon. The tunnels are real close to each other.
thing you don't want to do is lose your phone out here because you cannot recover it. There's no road down through Toltec Gorge at all. Card number two, anyways. I filled up a whole SD card on the first card. Oh, yeah. Worth an hour worth of footage, yeah. All the way from Chama. I was recording all the way up to Lobato. And then I would do it between the pass and stuff. in 4K, so who cares? I don't. Plus, this goes on to YouTube, so I'm not real worried about it. After it's done, I process it. The way I do is I upload it raw. I don't even edit it. I leave it as is. Yep. Because a lot of people said it's better unedited than edited. Which I've learned. careful of these trees. I believe it's coming up. Rock tunnel. What's that gorge? My tunnel. Yeah, it should be next. Because that one is not as dark as this one was. Probably see it when on your end when we make the curve. Yeah, yeah, it's the straightaway. Yep. So it's on the along the straightaway or it's snowing. I think we have the curve and then my tunnel. It was right before um another like tangle foot curve but we're going to go through whiplash curve so it should be coming up after that or unless
How far are we from my tunnel? My tunnel? Yeah. I know we just went through Rock Tunnel. It's going to take about 9 minutes, 8 minutes. That's what um, I was wondering. About 2 miles. Yeah. Do you think 168 is out running today? Uh, no, but she was yesterday. I know she was out yesterday. Did you get pictures of her? I wasn't here. Oh wait, how far did she go? Uh, 287 and a half. Yeah, I see was I was the, in... I was on the curb. Oh, see I was in Chama, I missed it. Oh man. Now, they're not going to be running tomorrow or today but they might tomorrow yeah so i don't think i'll be on the group for that one but yeah. uh yeah if you can tomorrow tomorrow i'm off to durango uh, that's a sadly you buy your tickets already i'm just going up to rail fence for the night oh, cool. but yeah that was fun going through rock tunnel I never been, went through it before. Oh, you just did you, uh... Back in Chama. But I'm going all the way now. Oh, good. So it's time for a change. I've so seen you, her. If you're hanging out, in the, are you taking the bus back to Chama? Yep. Okay. I was going to say, if you're hanging out, you can fly me down. Because um, what time does the bus... What, what time are we due to get in? Five, I think. And the bus leaves, gets back to Chama at six. Oh, yeah, that's right, huh? Yeah. So we don't even have much time to look around at Antonio, do we? Not really. I'd say if you if you hurry, the lighting will be real uh, will be real nice to get some shots of 168. And the rotary, because that's out. So they had to clean out the book box to make sure that the uh, Yeah, for the rotary, yeah. Yeah, to make sure that it was all ready for the inspector. So yes, we got that job. You I feel sorry for you. I thought it would take two hours. I thought it would take two or three hours at the most. Really? Two days. Two days, yeah. Eh, it's all right. Yeah. We missed it earlier through the um, before we got to Osher. Two planes flew right through the canyon. Oh, cool. Yeah, we had two Air Force. Did you see what kind of planes they were? They had four propellers on them. Oh, probably C-130s. C-130s, yeah, yeah. I think that's what it was. They test in here all the time. How are they able to fly through here with these? In a way. Um, they can't. Not really. No. I mean, they're just flying through the narrow canyons. They'll, they'll turn them on their side and fly full that gorge. Now that is amazing to see. And how they navigate it on their side oh, yeah. without crashing. Well, that's the whole. This is a whole training ground for them. Here yeah. For uh, Afghanistan. I and Baghdad. Yeah. The first time riding all the way through, huh? Welcome. Thanks. This is my home side here. Yeah. See, I'm at, my home site is Chama. Oh, cool. I'm in Albuquerque, so three hours away. Yeah. At least one good thing is, yesterday I was out pulling weeds. Mm -hmm. The cold triple track was so bad. Oh, my goodness. It's still worse. There's double the weeds that I pulled. Remember the fence? Yep. Oh, cool. How's it going? Good. How's it going? Oh. Fine. Oh, Phantom Curve or yeah. something like that? Yeah. Where that. Where all the derailments happened. Oh, no, that's a. That's a. Oh, yeah, derailment up at Phantom. But, uh. The real thing was that Toltec, or the. What's that called? Calico Cut. I get all the Calico Cut, yeah. That has been given us pain for, uh, what, 130, 139 years now? Because of that cut? Sliding down on the Oh, yeah. Well, you can see it. This one, too, here. Not as much. No. Whatever happened to those cars after the accident? I guess they were scrapped. Oh, they're still coming. Huh? The uh, sheep cars? Were they sheep cars or passenger cars? Uh, which accident were you talking about? Because there were two that happened. The one that happened at Phantom Curve was the one train that was at night coming through. Uh, the um, the head-on? 169 and 411? Yeah. Um, 169's actually an Alamosa. I know it's an Alamosa. Uh, so they pulled that one out, but I'm pretty sure they took the torch to 411. Yeah, because um, 411 is no more. They yeah. said it's not even anymore. I'm pretty sure it's just busted up and people run it. it. Wasn't that an express train or something? Express and a freight head on. I wonder what ever happened to the express cars. 
they're still um, down where they are. If uh, there's still freight car bodies down there. It wasn't here, it was actually probably a little further that way. Yeah. Uh, it was just it was it was between Rock Tunnel and uh California. I wonder if you guys are ever going to bring those spray cars up from down there. Probably not. You think they're still in good condition, even? No. I mean, we've got that, we've got better condition spray cars than the restoration here. Yeah. In the yards. True. Yeah. Would it be worth displaying them at least? Maybe. See, I think that would be. A, I think that would be more of a like a, one of the joint um, projects with the friends. Yeah, but how would we get down there exactly to go get them? Now there's the real thing. <laughs> you can't go from Osier out there. Or could you? I think you could run a, I think you could run a, um, a flat with a crane, close it onto it. You know that, uh, you know that, uh, work, that work crane that they have, uh, that old diesel work crane from the, um, the Institute of Shop up in the restoration shed, if you ever get a chance. Yeah, but uh, I'll mention that would probably be started up on this side, pulled over to Antonito, put them up there. Yeah, but I don't think it'll happen for another 20 years if if they still at all. last this long. Oh yeah, so they're probably in worse condition than we thought. Oh, here's the Phantom Curve. Phantom Curve, big, uh, big oh, dangerous yeah. zone. Oh, the curve's actually been pretty good to us. You got lucky. Yeah. All this rock likes to see where it is. Yeah. I'm going to take a quick picture and then I'll get out of your way. That's so fine. Beautiful country, you know? It's God's country. Yeah. yeah. That little flat spot right there? Yeah. That's one of the little, that little uh, summer cabin. Wait, where? That little flat spot, I'd love to put a little summer cabin right oh, there. Oh, yeah. Good luck with that. Now, where do you live? Do you live in Antonito? Or do you live in Yeah. yeah. And you do this all summer long? All summer long, then I go back to Dallas. Going to school out there or to your family? Nah, it's just where I live right now. Oh, okay. And I'm from Houston, Texas. But I'll probably be moving somewhere out west after this. Oh, really? Yeah. How far out west do you want to go? No, not yet. I might even move up to New England somewhere. It all depends. My wife's still in school. She's on her last semester of her neuroscience degree. So we're looking at grad school for her right now. Not bad. So it depends on where. Yeah, it does. It also depends on the money. Yeah. <laughs> Who will pay her? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh -huh. Where's the pressure at? Almost to 80 pounds of pressure. What's up? We're almost to 80 pounds of pressure on the brakes. Filling them back up. Huh? Filling them back up. Yep. And it was at 90 when we got up here. To, 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 oh, sir. And they did the running brake test. Huh? They did the running brake test, checked it all. Yep. This isn't the side you have to worry too much about anyway. Yep. You hear RGS 20 is back at um, Colorado Air Museum? Oh, really? He's back. Oh, nice. They're finishing up the rest of the work there. And they did a steam up test on her. Ooh. She can run under her own power. She's right. certified at 120 psi. That's what she's certified at. That's not bad. No, and That's she's coming here. We actually have plans. 
Yeah. Right, well, she's it's not completely finished yet. They don't have the cab on her yet. They still have other things to put on her, but yeah. How long she be on, How long she been underway? I I say many months. Strasburg had her for a while. Strasburg, you said? Strasburg did the full main boiler work. Ah, uh, Strasburg did all that. Yeah. I could have sent her here. I guess we would have need more staff, but we're hoping to one of these days be off like that for the especially for the narrow gauge stuff. Yeah. For sure. Must be coming up to something for them to be whistling. Huh? Stand right here and we just stop going into the tunnel. Oh, that's right, my tunnel. Yep. Pass 311. Huh? Pass 311. Yep, my post 311. I'm going after RGF 41 and not Terry Farm. They never run that engine anymore. You want to buy it? Uh, I'm actually uh, trying to acquire it. DNF. Shop crew own it. Really? Yeah, they're old timers that used to that still work at Durango own RGS 41. So they're just loading it basically, I mean basically it's a static model over there. It runs. Oh, it does run? Yeah. But I want to get it out of there and turn it back to coal. It's an oil burner. Wow. It shouldn't be too hard to turn it back to oil. Only oil. Truck, the only locomotives that should be oil burners are the ones that were built as it. Huh? Only engines that should be oil burners are the ones that were built as it. I don't like what they're doing with their uh, K-37 over there at the DNS. Well, they have to, because of that lawsuit. And the fire. Oh yeah, here comes my tunnel. Yeah. They said DNS started it. Yeah, they did. Yep. For sure. Oh yeah, mud tunnel. This yeah. is the shortest one. Yeah. Out of rock tunnel. I read all the FRA reports on the, on the DNS fire. And? You know, I gotta actually say I agree with the FRA on the internet. I do too. Well, um, it came down to their fire patrol. Yeah. They weren't, they weren't adequately prepared, they weren't adequately trained. Exactly. We take our fire patrol. Seriously, yeah. And, you know, for years and years people are like, why are we doing this all this? Why are we doing it all this? Uh, all this yep, all this fire. Yep. Yeah. Uh, now we're yep. That's why they're turning 497 down oil burners. 18th is still there. They're turning into a freaking 835. They lose 2,000 pounds of traction force by their uh, yeah. oil burner. True.
potato, never will I. Four ninety four, uh, or four ninety five. Four ninety five, folks, coming up with the freight cars around it.
that's why there's people on both sides watching. Yeah, but if I was those cars, I would I would install something, you know, like some kind of marker that says "Bing train coming." We have stuff on the road. Yeah, yeah but that means crossing. <laughs>
for a minute. That's fine. This is the legend of Narrow Gauge Mountain Railroad. Howdy, I'm Dennis Weaver. For over a century, people have come to ride the train between Durango and Silverton. The tracks were originally laid in 1881 to tap into the Rocky Mountains silver and gold. But as we'll learn, though it brought vast fortunes out of the mountains, it also delivered millions of experiences, images, and memories, all of them priceless. Today it delivers an inspiring experience as the oldest continuously running remnant of America's westward expansion. We can still ride it, just as it was back in the beginning, behind vintage steam locomotives in the original cars through some of the most spectacular mountains in Colorado. How are we able to do this? How did this branch of the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad survive when all around it others were scrapped and abandoned? <laughs> well, we don't have all the answers. In fact, much about the early years remains a mystery since many of the official records were lost or destroyed a long time ago. So, to help us reconstruct the past, we'll hear from historians, rail enthusiasts, and longtime employees as we learn about an American legend known as the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad. You know, I, when I started, I was over in the car shop and we were bringing in these cars that were just. Um, chicken coops and tool sheds. The DNRG wasn't called the sick man of Wall Street for nothing. It was it was usually in trouble, real serious trouble. Yeah. There were a lot of people that talked about trying to save it and a lot of people who made some minimal efforts. But Mr. Bradshaw came in and he had the desire and enthusiasm. Desire and enthusiasm. No two words better describe the human elements that have kept this train alive. We're in the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad Museum aboard the Nomad, a high-class business car from 1878. And I gotta tell you, it's a great place to jump into the past. We'll follow these gentlemen's conversations as they shed some light on how this train 
has overcome incredible odds along its tracks through time. Our experience, our environment that we operate in is unbelievably pristine and unique and and you get a sense of wilderness. You see what it's like. And then you sit back and it forces you to say, golly, when the guys built this railroad or when these miners first came here, how did they make it? How did they make it? It's so rugged and so rough out there. One thing that the viewers might keep in mind when they ride the train and they go over the High Line is that not only that cost a thousand dollars a foot to build, which was a sensational figure then, but Imagine when you get tired looking 400 feet down in the Animas Canyon, uh, that they had to blast that that shelf out by having men in what might be a bosun chair or whatever you want to call it, being lowered over the the cliff to to drill holes, put the powder in, put the uh, blasting cap in, put the fuse in, lighting it so it was timed and hope that their friends got them up out of there before the thing went off. Uh, it was an amazing construction effort and. They thought Palmer was going to go bankrupt right then. The, uh, a lot of the Eastern investors were stunned when they started to hear what Palmer was doing. They thought he'd never recoup that one. Well, I think that's why uh, they didn't take any pictures of the construction. They were like a lot of the roads. They didn't take any pictures yeah. of the construction because they didn't want the investors to see what they were doing. <laughs> After they got it all built and how spectacular yeah. it was, then they, sure. they took pictures and showed them off. Which is so sad because yeah. we've lost a part of our history. We have those beautiful photographs of Palmer, all of them after the railroad was built. Uh, I'd give an eye tooth to get some of those earlier ones. I'd love oh, to have someone yeah. showing those guys hanging over that oh, yeah. thing. Yes, exactly. For the sake of history, I'd love it. The man behind the Denver and Rio Grande was General William Jackson Palmer. It was his vision that steered the railroad from Denver into the San Juan Mountains. His locomotive steamed over three-foot wide narrow gauge rails. This made it cheaper to build and easier to negotiate the sharp twists and turns through the mountains. And although Palmer was a visionary railroad man, the nation's tumultuous financial times and a torrid building pace would eventually undo his leadership of the DNRG. Rio Grande, as we know, uh, had a very precarious uh, history as far as revenues are concerned. I don't know how many receiverships it went into. As a matter of fact, I was, when I started working in 1950, it just came out of a re mm -hmm. receivership. It was in turmoil all the time. And, and to look back now it, and, and to see and note that there is no longer a Rio Grande, uh, which is... Uh, I don't think we ever thought we'd see that, do you? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I sure didn't. The Durango and Silverton line was once connected to many routes that formed the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. But in the 1870s, the mines and mining towns surrounding Silverton were far removed from the main rail lines of their day. Transportation was a huge problem. Using mule trains and wagons was slow, dangerous, and impossible in winter. They were sitting on mountains of riches which they couldn't get out to cash in. They pleaded for rail service, and in 1879, advanced crews of the Denver and Rio Grande began surveying a course for what was to become Durango. From there, they marked the 45 miles of mountainous terrain into Silverton. When the line finally reached Durango in 1881, the most expensive and difficult part of DNRG San Juan extension was yet to be blasted out of the mountains. Getting through these mountains was quite a feat. They worked all through the winter with picks, shovels, and dynamite. Incredibly, in just eight months, the Denver and Rio Grande would reach Silverton in the summer of 1882 and immediately begin serving the mines of the San Juan Mountains. Shortly thereafter, a local man who had been building toll roads through the mountains turned his attention to trains, Otto Mears, the pathfinder of the San Juans laid tracks to feed Chattanooga, Ironton, and others. This Silverton line was built across terrain even more rugged than the route between Durango and Silverton. Mears would eventually own three small railroad lines. They transported payloads, supplies, and people between remote mining towns and the DNRG 
which would connect them with the world beyond. Mears also built the Rio Grand Southern, an extension that ran from Durango to Ridgeway and into Uray. Along the way, the Rio Grande Southern had stops in Telluride and other mining towns of that era. Altogether, these lines fed a region that became one of the richest mining districts in the United States. One remnant of the Rio Grande Southern is the number 42, an 1887 vintage locomotive that now resides alongside others in the Durango and Silverton Narrow Gauge Museum. Durango and Silverton were two of the busiest railroad hubs in the Rockies. Silverton claimed to be the narrow gauge capital of the world, but even the heydays were not without trial. It was just a fact of mountain life that natural disasters would make things difficult along these tracks. Snow slides were a common headache, completely cutting off Silverton and other towns from needed supplies. The trains bucked untold volumes of snow, trying to keep the tracks clear and supply lines open. Where men and locomotives couldn't clear the tracks, they burrowed through the snow, creating tunnels for the trains. Floods, and especially the flood of the century in 1911, wiped out many miles of track and almost bankrupted the line. Then on top of these hardships came two man-made disasters the First and Second World Wars. The U.S. Army wanted to take all the locomotives and most of the cars up to Alaska. One thing that happened in the Second World War, which I think we tend to overlook, is that uh, we were running the narrow gauge railroad up in Alaska. They were running out of rolling stock, and they came down here, and they were going to take a lot of the rolling stock off these. In fact, they got some of the stuff off the Rio Grande Southern, but Betty Pellet over at Rico, who was a state legislator in this area at that time, she fought hard to keep those locomotives and the rolling stock. Hmm. Yeah, but they took all the 70s, except the, the three that we have left mm -hmm. now. Right. Uh, Jim took two, seven. Two, yep. two they were going to, I think, take almost all of it if they hadn't, yeah. uh, if Betty hadn't fought them. Fortunately, the last three K-28s in the world are, are here and running today. Otherwise, might have, like you said, they might all be gone. Because of the Second World War, the, uh, the demise of the narrow gauge uh, started, actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they were doing away with uh, the steam locomotives and replacing them with diesels. Uh, this little train here survived that because of the rail fans that discovered that this little the Silicon branch was still running. And I owe a debt of gratitude to all the rail fans because if they hadn't discovered that this little train was still running, that wouldn't be what it is today as a, uh, as a passenger train. Well, and then they really discovered it when he took it to Tomahawk came out and they saw the country and saw the railroad knew that it was still running and after the war people finally could buy automobiles again and they started trekking to Durango. After the wars, the Denver and Rio Grande began a decades-long process of abandoning unprofitable segments of its empire. Silverton and Durango were threatened because the mines were playing out. One by one, Silverton lost the three railroads that had connected the mines and towns around it. By 1942, the only rails in Silverton were the original ones leading back to Durango. Then an unexpected windfall came out of nowhere. Hollywood discovered the train. From 1949 through the 60s, the Silverton branch began to benefit from parts in Around the World in 80 Days, Ticket to Tomahawk, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Rio Grande, and many others. When they made the movie Ticket to Tomahawk, I believe, they painted uh, several cars uh, Rio Grande gold, and the railroad liked it. And uh, so from that time on, I believe 1951, they started painting them. An equally colorful side note is the Galloping Goose, a 1933 Pierce Arrow that became a rail-hugging economy bus. They served towns along the Rio Grande Southern after the Second World War, but with the demise of the RGS, the Galloping Goose disappeared. 
it's too bad because the popularity of the galloping goose which we had on the road mm -hmm. last year and mm -hmm. yeah. there had been a wonderful um, excursion if you could have gone from say Rico up over the uh, uh, lizard head pass and that thing but unfortunately the, it was about 10 years too uh, early I mean they pulled it out in the early 50s and been, if they could have held on to that for another 10 years it would have been a magnificent companion to this road Thanks to the restoration efforts of the Galloping Goose Historical Society, Galloping Goose No. 5 survived, and still it runs with specials on the Durango and Silverton line each year. In 1951, the Denver and Rio Grande Western, as it was now called, abandoned the passenger runs that connected Durango with Alamosa and all points east. The railroad wanted to close down the Durango and Silverton branch, too. That year, the passenger traffic was less than 3,000 riders. But due to promotional efforts by local employees and rail fans, passenger traffic increased over tenfold to 37,000 by 1963. And as summer ridership continued to increase through the 60s, the Denver and Rio Grande Western thought the line might just be worth saving. Then, in 1970, a natural disaster, a huge flood wiped out miles of track, and with it, the razor-thin profit generated by tourism. Finally, in 1981, the Denver and Rio Grande Western sold the Durango and Silverton branch. Mr. Bradshaw came in and he had the financial wherewithal, but most important, he had this mission in life to preserve history. He had this sense of what a treasure this was. And it was his drive and ambition and absolute focus on saving this historical heritage that has put the Durango and Silverton Narrow Guide Railroad in a position to live forever. I always say, and I've said it more than once, is the fact that if Mr. Bradshaw had not bought the railroad when he did, this Silverton branch uh, would not exist uh, to this day because it was going by the way as all, all branch lines uh, disappeared. The 80s brought huge improvements in every aspect of railroad operation. The schedule went from one daily train in the summer to five trains and a year-round operational basis. The winter train schedule was brought back for the first time in decades, allowing people to see spectacular snow-covered scenery. The tracks were busier than ever when misfortune struck again in 1989. In the dead of winter, a fire raged through the roundhouse. Striking near midnight, it burned up the timbers above and around the locomotives. At first light, the scene was more like a war zone than a train yard. A historic landmark that had been one of Durango's first buildings was reduced to rubble. But the historic significance of the roundhouse paled in comparison to the outlook for the future. As badly scorched engines were uncovered and pulled from the ashes, Many people wondered if the trains would ever run again. Uh, everybody thought, well, this is the end of the railroad. And could have been. Rather than the end, the fire signaled another beginning. The day of the fire, Bradshaw had been in Durango on business. Instead of retiring the line, he decided to rebuild it. Not just the damaged locomotives, but also the roundhouse, keeping as much as he could from the original. Onto the roundhouse, he built a machine shop to ensure the railroad's survival. We have a machine shop that rivals any uh, commercial or industrial facility. We have uh, craftsmen that literally can take uh, a piece of brass and turn it down into a uh, operating component of any of our coaches or locomotives. The unique thing about this operation is we're completely self-sufficient. Ten years after the fire and after two decades of careful restoration, Bradshaw sold to Durango and Silverton, 
the new owners, American Heritage Railways, continued the tradition of honoring the train's historic significance. I count him as a very good friend and, and, and a supporter, and I think if there's one thing he's instilled in me, and that's toe the line on the history. You know, I think the most significant thing that Al has done with its ownership is uh, enhanced what Mr. Bradshaw had accomplished when he acquired the railroad. And when Al bought the railroad, one of his first directives to me was to open a museum. And that really is just an extension of this living, breathing, operating uh, railroad uh, that's really uh, a museum from Silverton to Durango. So opening this facility has allowed us to further enhance the historical preservation. We talk about preservation, and where else can you go? And literally, you get the smell, the noise, the cinders, the smoke, which we talked about. This is, this is an all-encompassing sort of preservation. Uh, I, I don't think people realize that. They just, uh, preservation is too often just inanimate. If you observing something, well, here it's not. You are involved. You're part of this preservation. If you've ever seen as much dead equipment as we have, <laughs> and, and these fellows work on it uh, all winter long, and like he says, in the spring of the year, uh, when they, they come alive. It's like a breathing piece of machinery that talks to you. And like I say, everybody's got a little bit of railroad blood in there. It just starts to work on you. And, and it's just, it's a romantic part of history that uh, most everybody can relate to. Steam engines are a very graceful machine. Um, the sound of, the, of an engine and the, the way the side rods move is, is just, a, it's like a, it's such synchronization and, and uh, it's just a beautiful thing to watch. And if you walk through the roundhouse at night in the summertime and all six engines are sitting there and they're hot and they're hissing and popping. It's like walking through a dragon's lair or something. Yeah, it's really just is. really a neat thing. They're yeah. kind of resting. And... Oh, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience for anyone who takes it. A sense of the past and the present, and it's part of our heritage that's going to stretch into the future. And that is, in essence, what this railroad's all about, I think. Yeah, steam railroads left us quite a legacy. By linking the east to the west, the railroad altered the face of our nation. Many of our major cities and towns were originally just whistle stops that sprang up along the railways. The steam trains held a promise of progress, opportunity, and adventure. The Drango and Silverton is a lasting tribute to these early locomotives. And today, we all have the opportunity to look back and see this country as it was then, raw and rugged, especially when you see it from the inside of a steam train that's still making tracks through time. I'm Dennis Weaver. Thanks for watching.